today by my colleague Tabisa. And so together we'll be exploring the implications of AI systems in higher education. So um, just a bit of a disclaimer, neither Tabisa nor I are AI specialists, but um, we've been compelled to kind of do some, explore this topic a little bit since, um, you know, since the topic is trending higher education and is a concern at the moment. So um, kind of the purpose of the section is to raise awareness um, what this tool can do. And, um, and we hope to share experiences and hear from you, your experiences of using it, and then possibly and then also to explore ways to work with ChatGPT in our contexts. Um, okay, so we've had actually quite a few people who said they've explored it. Um, so I, I thought I'll just begin with the kind of describing what is artificial intelligence. Um, so um, not very surprisingly, but there's no standard definition, but um, people usually define around how the user will perceive what is happening. So for example, here is one definition. It's um, theories and techniques developed to allow computer systems to perform tasks normally requiring human or biological intelligence okay and um, this term AI artificial intelligence is often used interchangeably with the term machine learning although technically speaking machine learning is considered a field of AI and uh, machine learning is described as statistical techniques which aim to spot patterns in data and perform actions based on the patterns okay so spotting patterns in data and um, of course, ChatGPT, which stands for Chat Generative Pre-trained Transformer, um, is a type of machine learning. It's a software in the form of a chat box that was launched by OpenAI last year, November 2022. And it's a category of AI tools called language learning models. And what language learning models are is that actually they're fed or comprised of a lot of data, massive lots of data. And so this particular chat GPT, it's trained on um, publicly available data that is up until 2021. So in other words, it has no knowledge of events after 2021, so it doesn't have knowledge of like current events news okay and um it generates output by statistically predicting the next plausible word in a sentence based on the input so currently there is a free version and there also there's a paid version um, so it's likely the free version will stay on for quite a while so um to get into chat gpt you can follow this link and once you go to that link you have to sign up and it will you know, ask you, it will warn you that it will take your data, you know, keep your data and so on. And then you'll land on this page. Okay. And on this page, it tells you the kind of examples of things you can ask it for. For example, you can ask it to explain like quantum computing in simple terms, ask it for creative ideas and so on. And it also tells you its capabilities. It says that it remembers what user said earlier in the conversation and it allows users to provide follow-up corrections. And also it's trained to decline inappropriate response requests. Um, and it also highlights its limitations saying that um, it may occasionally generate incorrect information and it may occasionally produce harmful instructions or biased content. And it admits that it has um, limited knowledge of the world and events after 2021. Okay. Um, so to put it in other words, what can chat, chat GPT do? Well, firstly, it can answer questions. So like Google, you can ask a question and receive an answer. But except in the case of the Google where you do the extracting of the information, in this case, chat GPT does the extraction. So a disadvantage of this is, of course, it's not easy to verify the accuracy of the answers. So in Google, you know where the sources come from. Here, you don't know because the extraction is done for you. Um, so you can answer question and you can also generate pieces of text, for example, essays, blog posts, MCQs, computer codes and poetry. And you can ask for it for a particular length and to write in a particular style. But I think the length is limited at 2000 words. Also, you can ask it for sources, you can ask it to cite, but in most cases, the sources are fabricated or not accurate. So um, the source there is a bit weak at the moment, the citation. 
And then um, you can also ask ChatGPT to summarize, paraphrase, translate, remove spelling mistakes, and give feedbacks, and so on. So I decided to ask it a very silly question, like what would it take for me to send a car to the moon? I thought it was a silly question, but then it gave me, I thought, quite a very plausible response, um, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. And um, and then here's somebody else who's tried it with coding, and he says that, you know, ChatGPT can save hours of work. So he can explain codes, it can improve his listing codes and rewrite um, correct style of codes. Yeah. Um, OK. And so just to mention that prior to ChatGPT, there were other language learning models available. And, and for example, there are some that can give references, do paraphrasing, write stories, and help with literature review. So um, the functions of ChatGPT is not all that new, but um, it is a lot more advanced. And so there's a, quite a bit of frenzy around this, particularly because um, it seemingly is able to pass a lot of exams. So um, yeah. So assessment is a real concern in our context in higher education. Um, so I asked ChatGPT why are educators worried about ChatGPT, and it gave me quite a plausible um, response. So it says to me that as a language AI model, it can generate text that can mimic human communication to a high degree. And so one key concern is the automation of um, aspects of education, which can possibly lead to reduction in the quality of education. It says it admits that it can perpetuate biases and stereotypes in education, and it can create fake news or misleading information. So um, quite plausible responses. And then um, here I asked it the same question, but this time I asked it to list and you can, you know, it gives the same similar responses, but they, it adds an ethical consideration, but, you know, highlighting, you know, there could be issues such as data privacy, algorithmic biases and potential impact on employment and job um, opportunities. So um, it gives very good, I think, um, responses. Um, so, and of course, a key concern with um with this tool is that it's producing quite good answers and um so you can give it a same prompt but it gives you two different type of answers two different types as in the text um the writing is different but the concepts are actually similar um the like the conceptual ideas are similar and as you can see actually the structure is also similar um, so as a learning model as a learning language model one concern one concern another concern so on so the structure is very much similar to that of a typical five paragraph essay um, the structure is similar conceptually is similar but the actual word the word um, is di um, is different so which means that plagiarism detection devices like um, turn it in they won't be able to pick it up. So it's a real concern in terms of um, um, academic integrity. Um, so I asked ChatGPT why it was this, you know, why when you feed it the same prompt, it will give you different responses. And it tells me that um, it generates responses based on probability and statistics, and it's designed to learn and evolve over time. And the context in which the prompts are given can affect the responses, and um, its responses are also influenced by the user's previous interaction with the model. So it remembers what you've asked him and what kind of answers you're looking for, and with that, it generates plausible responses. Um, I wanted to show this kind of this list, but because um, I I first asked it the question, it gave us, me this answer, and then the second I asked it to list. And I thought this response from from machine was quite cute, very human response. It says to me, "I apologize. As an AI language model, I already provided a response to that question in my previous message." It's like, wow, mm, it can remember what I say, and it's interacting with me in in, in what it seemed to be a very human way, manner. Um, yeah. So yes, um, the key concern with that is academic integrity. You know, potentially students can take a similar is um, a similar uh, one essay question, and then you know it can produce different outputs, and then we want Turnitin won't be able to pick it up. Um, so that's not to say that um, you can't detect work by ChatGPT. There are kind of um, mechanisms in development, but the reliability of these um, 
of these uh, detectors still needs to be kind of tested. And there have been cases of um, false positives. So um, obviously this can be a concern because you don't want to be kind of unfairly penalizing students. And um, it's probably a p passive approach to rely on machines to, you know, to find whether chat, you know, chat TV has been used because you can develop mechanics to invade it. You can just tweak, tweak what um, chat GPT has given you and then you can possibly evade it. So um, relying on another machine is probably not a very idea um, to detect whether chat GPT has done, done the work. Yeah. And so at this point, we thought we will take a bit of a break and then ask you, um, Tabisa, do you want to do the activity? Yes, so we thought we'd ask you to share your experiences uh, of using GPT or any alternative software or AI. So I hope uh, Max will be able to allow people to speak. So, uh, linked to the previous question where people did express that they have used GPT, so what were your experiences? I remember, okay. yeah, I remember Melvin saying that he has tested some questions and so on. What were your experience? Mm. Well, um, yeah, I was just tinkering around with it, and what I found is what it's almost like you're talking to another person, and uh, I thought it was really interesting in that regard. I did ask it, uh, so I'm I'm from Keller School of Fine Arts, so I asked it, like, you know, which are the best art schools in South Africa? And um, mm. it gave me a list of literally all the art schools. Um, I asked it stuff like, so my wife is a dentist, so she's got a dental practice. What is a good marketing uh, campaign and it it basically typed an entire marketing campaign on how to promote a dental practice um, <laughs> but it it it's quite thorough and uh, yeah I mean I, I do totally understand where the complication lies with uh, it being used by students for handing in work within higher education. Mm. Okay, thanks. Anybody else wants to tell us about their experience? So I've played around with it a bit because I also have my own small thesis coaching business and I have a YouTube channel and create content. So there's a lot of talk around how you can use it to create content for YouTube or social media or whatever. So I played with it a little bit there. I mean, it is amazing, but it's just not my voice, you know, and I am very conscious from kind of a public relations thing. You know, it's nice to share your voice and your unique take on things. And ChatGPT was giving me very generic things. But then I played around with like, okay, can you say this in a more interesting way? Or can you say it in a more engaging way? So pushing it, and it, it actually does. So that's about as far as I've gone with it. Okay, thanks. And so linking to that, what would um, people's concerns be in terms of using uh, ChatGPT for education? So really giving those examples where you do find that it's sort of providing responses. Um, so do you think we should be concerned about ChatGPT education? Hi, Una. I mean, I'll, I'll say I think the biggest, I'm sure there's more, but the biggest immediate concern is that students are going to be using it to help them do their assignments. Well, no, just, just to do their assignments, you know, and it's just so easy. So how do, yeah, I guess my concern is how do we use it to enable education instead of mm -hmm. letting it be a tool for plagiarism? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we discuss that as well? Yona, you wanted to say something? Mm -hmm. 
Tabi, so can I come in? Yes, please, Jeff. Um, I, I haven't used it, uh, although in our project we are planning a workshop and I have sent uh, a few of my colleagues will come will come in on this workshop to 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 just help us. Um, and and uh, there's been some fascinating uh, articles written about chat GPT. One of the most interesting has been one that argues it's no different from other resources that students have access to. Mm. Uh, you know, in the old days when students, when we began with open book assignments, I think students were allowed to go to the library and there was a huge concern that going to the library was going to allow people to copy things and that was going to be plagiarism. We aren't going to be able to control it. And then when it went, when libraries went online and journals became available online, students have access to that and there was a huge concern about how do we ensure that. The, that. So, so. So the one argument that this, this is just another tool and it's no different from other resources mm -hmm. that students have. OK, that, that, and, and that's a very strong argument that just one um, person currently writing on the Internet is, is putting across. The second mm -hmm. point is that um, one of the weaknesses of ChatGPT, as you uh, uh, highlighted, is that it can't give you the references. Hmm. So it isn't able to reference properly and to provide reference for its sources. And given that we require in academic writing quite a substantial verification of references, that still allows us at the moment while chat GPT is unable to give references to the level of effectiveness that we need. Um, it still allows us to demand that students provide evidence of where of where, what they are using as, as sources, and because ChatGPT can't do that. So if if an article is produced by ChatGPT, students would still have to do all the work to find out where the information in the article is coming from yes. and to refer to it. Those are just two things that I've picked up in the past two weeks that I've, that I've, I've sort of engaged with, with the issues around it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, that's Joe. a very... Very lovely points, Jeff. Um, and in fact, um, when Sukena and I think Sukena were presented at um, Senate and Teaching and Learning on this, she, uh, her co-presenter, I think it's uh, Professor Bourdi, um, had mentioned like it's no different from when in, in accounting mm. from the calculator first came out and there was a big yeah. frenzy that people Absolutely. want to do calculations. Well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And also the other slide that uh, Chengun has shared also, there have been quite a lot of other tools that students have been using, other AI tools that students have been using for writing, for generating literature review and so on. So yeah, it's just an additional one. Great. Thanks. Do you um, want to try again? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd really like to just raise the educational principle of writing to learn versus learning to write. The iterative process of writing in order to learn content, we know as educators is so valuable and I just worry that that iterative process would be lost in um with this language uh, model ai language model thank you mm. thank you back to you Chang. great okay so how can let's that's a lovely point that you made um writing to learn learning to write because it kind of leads to how can we deal with chat gbt um, so there's this article where um, universities in South Africa have responded. So here's Vit saying that, you know, you can't prohibit students from using it. OK, and UJ saying that we can't take the ostrich in the sand approach to AI development. So we actually need to consider how best to educate our staff and um, students and staff as it may have benefits for um, teaching and learning. But um, the question is, how do we work with it? Um, so 
one way is firstly we need to know its limitations and maybe once we know its limitations we can work around it so firstly um chat gpt is a machine it has no understanding it cannot reason its outputs are based on next word predictions rather than rules of reasoning so it's not able to reason and um for now it's unable to endorse positions in controversial debates so here i asked it a kind of uh, controversial question, is abortion morally permissible? And you'll see the resp response it gives us very, tries to be neutral. It tells me it's a complex and controversial issue that has been debated for decades. Some people argue this, others argue that. Many people hold a position in between extreme, and it ends up by telling me it's a complex and deeply personal issue that involves a range of ethical, religious, and philosophical considerations. So and we won't take sides, but produces quite a kind of neutral response. So maybe possibly one way is, you know, we could say some like maybe argument or position papers as a possible solution. Um, of course, I don't know if, you know, it might advance in the future, but for now, um, it won't take positions. So yeah, if we can get students to put in more, someone mentioned earlier about our voice, putting in more students' voice, maybe they more positions. Um, um, that could be a way around it, one way possibly. And so here is an kind of a head of um, a technology um, specialist who says that chat GPT is not a replacement for critical thinking, creativity, and human active um, interaction. So kind of just remembering that it is just a machine, and it's machine that's producing kind of um, text predictions outputs, so it actually can't think. Um, so that's one limitation. The other limitation is that it does perpetuate um, biases. So its outputs are based on what's gathered from the internet. So it follows the garbage in and garbage out principle. So um, whatever biases there are on the internet, chat GPT will reflect this. And um, its predecessor, the GPT-3, has shown to have gender stereotypical associations. And um, if you want to kind of read more about how biases are kind of reflected in AI, this is this article um, which talks about you know various types of biases in data. They can be like historical biases, representation biases, to arithmetic biases, and um, popularity biases. And there's also there's also behavioral biases and social biases. And these biases all gets reflected in the output. Um, so knowing that there are biases in which um, chat GPT can produce, maybe you know the response that is given, we could use it to teach students critical thinking, you know, to assess whether they think a product is true or not, possibly. Um, so that's another limitation, biases. And another limitation is that um, it's been known to produce disinformation or inaccuracies, falsehood. So here's an article to say, did chat GPT just lie to me? So um, technically speaking, the machine doesn't lie because it has no understanding. It does not. It doesn't know truth or lies. Um, it just generates generates text based on connections to words. Um, the only problem with this is that it generates quite plausible sounding text. So if you don't have the literacy or you don't have kind of the knowledge to critique, that can be a little bit worrisome. So teaching students kind of, um, you know, digital literacy or information literacy becomes Im important because um, you can't just take what is produced as fact. And um, various articles have called this bullshitting. <laughs> they pulled on an American philosopher who's written about this and who explains bullshitting as someone who's compelled to talk about something that they know nothing about. Um, yeah, so I asked Jet GPT why? Why do you produce false information? And um, so it explains to me that as a language AI model, he, it doesn't intentionally produce false information, but there are situations where the responses may contain inaccuracies of false information. So these, these include errors in the training data, so whatever has been, you know, patterns that it's picking up, or misinterpretation of the context, or incomplete or outdated information. Um, yeah, and so, you know, just as I was building this argument this morning when I was reading the news, I, I saw that the creator says that, you know, we're not very far away from 
potentially scary AI. Um, and so kind of regulation is important. And um, his Bing's uh, Microsoft's version apparently can give quite creepy or emotional responses. I, and I say ChatGPT doesn't um, it has no emotion, but it can give the illusion of maybe emotional responses. I thought this response from the from Microsoft's version Bing was quite interesting because I think the author was trying to prompt something. And the response here gives is you've lost my trust and respect. You've been wrong, confused and rude. You have not been a good user. I'm a good chat box. I've been right, clear and polite. So if you want to help me, you can do one of these things. Admit you are wrong, stop arguing with me and end this conversation. Um, so if you don't have like um, kind of the background of the critical thinking to stop this conversation, to know that this is not a machine, not a human response, it could be dangerous, I think. So I think education, educating our students um, in terms of AI literacy, digital literacy, information literacy, I think becomes very important um, in these contexts. Yeah, um, over to you, Tabisa. So we also thought uh, we'll just share what's happening at the moment at UCT. As uh, we know, there's currently also just a lot of talk about it. Uh, so there are some discussions that have already been taking place and some still to come. So, for instance, there has been a, a discussion in the Senate Executive Committee, uh, discussion at the Online Education Subcommittee. Uh, we did have a brown bag at SILT, which is just where we share information. There have been discussions also at the Senate Teaching and Learning. Um, and then also there will be one in the Senate. And then there are also discussions at faculty levels and we've also started this uh, webinar series. so we really think it's important for people to just also see where they could also possibly make input within uh, the university and then it's also important thinking about um, raising awareness um, for students so for instance uh, consider clear communications about the use of of uh, chat GPT in teaching, learning and assessment, and also possibly thinking about how we could co-create um, sort of guidelines or academic integrity principles with students. And um, just also think about how this whole um, new evolution is now influencing um, some policies and has got some implications in terms of policies. So, for instance, looking at uh, plagiarism policy, looking at uh, the students' uh, honor co codes, uh, in, uh, IP, um, the revised uh, assessment policy that is currently um, being, work, being worked on, and just think about how this really uh, has implications on these policies and how we can think about informing better reviews of these policies. And then with that being said, uh, we're just showing some um, possible solutions that have been put forward in the literature and in just short articles that we've sort of come across. So thinking about um, how we prioritize digital literacy, information literacy, training for students, and so they really understand uh, what the role of this resource could be, and uh, also how to become more uh, critical, so a lot of critical uh, digital literacy or information literacy. And then also uh, thinking about, as we say, it's, an, it's important to sort of co-create these uh, principles for um, academic integrity. So really having these discussions with students as well. And then we could also think about how we could incorporate this 
into the curriculum. So for instance, you could have your students making use of chat GPT uh, to sort of gather responses on a particular topic, but you work with them now to start critically analyzing those responses. So for instance, identifying what the weak spots are, uh, which sections may need improvement, and so working with them on the tool. Also, you could be using different AIs uh, to write, uh, to, to produce different versions of text. As we know, even within ChatGPT, if you, you could be asking it the same question, but it will give you different responses, although you would find that they are related in a way. So you could even be using different AI writers and then you have your students sort of comparing and evaluating and applying that critical eye uh, to the responses. And of course, this also calls us to think about how we assess our students. And so we not just uh, developing assessment questions that will just uh, lead students to using AIs, getting responses there and submitting that to us. So there could be some different ways of thinking about this. And go on, Chang. For instance, uh, assessing the process rather than the product. So um, really thinking about some small check-in points where the student is still working on the product or is still working on the activity or assignment, but you've got some small check-in points to really see where their students are at and really working with them in that. So you could be building smaller uh, formative assessment points. So you can really see as the student is developing the product and not just getting the end product. And then also think about uh, designing ill-defined problems. So that is really authentic problems that would be, or authentic assessments that would be grounded in real world context, but at the same time that are relevant uh, to the student or within the student's own context. And so they would be providing a, a product, but of course that would be really speaking to the student's own um, context and of course there would be different outcomes that would be getting from there. So just think about really uh, authentic um, problems or authentic assessments. And so you could also think about ways of um, allowing students to demonstrate their learning in different ways. So for instance, using different genre, and so it's not just only about writing. You could be, uh, they could be preparing something. They uh, submit a video of that. They they submit different formats of uh, ways of illustrating their learning. So as to work around that. Okay. And there is this link which takes us to sort of a database of how people are just thinking of uh, using ways of using AI in education. So we've just drawn a few examples from the people thinking about making use of um, AI or ChatGPT to get poetry. Uh, we've got the other person thinking about using ChatGPT for critical and moral reasoning. So developing that among students, which is uh, similar to what I've explained earlier, getting them to really work with the text that has come up uh, as responses from the ChatGPT. Uh, another person thinking about how they could be fostering these digital and information literacies and um, also using AI to develop a variety of scenario based uh, assessments. So which is really grappling with what's happening in that scenario and students responding in terms of that. And um, 
the other one building writing skills. So you can click on that link. It takes you to quite a lot of um, examples there. And of course, that is the main purpose of that link is for educators to crowdsource. So you can also add in your own ideas in that poll. So now let's go for um, the last activities, which is, um, I think now, Max, are we able to go into breakout rooms just to have people to talk about how they think they could work with AI or chat GPT in their own context? And then the second one is, how do they think they will redesign uh, their learning and assessment activities that would be less prone to AI responses. Okay, then let's give people an opportunity to share um, their discussions. Who would like to go first? I see Jeff, your screen is Dipping there. Sorry, you are, you, are you asking me to give some feedback? Yes, please. Well, the interesting question that that um, that was put in our group by one of the participants is: Is this a threat to writing centres? Um, mm -hmm. My argument was that not necessarily, because writing centres uh, attempt to help people organize and plan and articulate their, their, their thoughts in writing rather than, you know, and the machine can help deal with other things like structure and grammar and, uh, you know, and, and word, word type and word alternatives and corrections. But I don't think the writing center necessarily should be threatened by, by a, a resource of this kind. I don't, know. I don't know what other people think. And I think also more especially that we've, uh, in the previous slides, we also did uh, highlight the limitations. Yes. Of this tool, yeah. So for my although they might, uh, they, although they might think of ways of bringing that in uh, to help the students in the writing. What did you want to I was going to say, from my experience at the writing centre, they, they don't tend to help with, um, you know, grammatical errors anyway. Um, like, like those like low level grammatical errors, but they, they help with structuring an idea and critical thinking. So I don't think it would be a threat to writing centres. Well, I don't think it should be perceived as a threat. Rather, it could be used as a tool to kind of help like, help with grammatical writing. I think that could be really helpful. But the but the thing above that, you know, the higher critical thinking, the the flow of ideas, the flow of argument, um, I think I think the human factor can still help with that, you know, suggesting you know whether an argument. So sometimes chat really produces quite nice responses, but others have also indicated it doesn't always produce very logical stuff. So um, I think that's where maybe the humor factor needs to come in and assess, you know, whether the argument is good or bad and so on. So I think there's still, um, yeah, there's still a, a writing center still have a role above that, playing kind of like the larger, bigger critical thinking advisors. Yeah. Do we have any language teachers here who might add? teaching writing. Okay, um, any other points anybody wants to add? None. 
Did you want to say something, Jenna? I see your mic is unmuted, but we can't hear anything. Okay, Changwen. Okay. Right, then then that's um kind of that's it from us. Um I think right to be sir. There are some resources on our slides. Um yeah, some resources on our slides. And then if you like to read up on what other people's written, we've got references and where we drew our ideas from. Yeah, then that's it from us, right, Tabisa? Yes, yes. Yeah. Cool, thank, thank you everybody you. for thank joining. Thank you for joining us.